to the We're rolling. Okay. All right. So this is part two of our reading for the choice. Um, uh, we actually have our Darius with us this this time, so I won't be reading that part. Um, I'm gonna give him a few seconds to say what he's gonna be doing with his character and say his his real name. You know, what I'm saying. So you go for it, Zay. Uh, first off, I'm glad to be here. Every uh, tomorrow's not promised, so I'm definitely got to be here with all you guys. Uh, I'm sorry that last time uh, I couldn't make it. Uh, you know, I was dealing with some unfortunate circumstances, but we here, and that's all I got asked for. Right. Um, yeah. And you're it's playing all, Darius. It's all good. Yep. I'm um, Zay Jeter. Um, and I'm the Darius. Mm -hmm. Let's give him a chance to talk. <laughs> Go ahead, Zay. What did you say? Yeah, I just said um, I'm Zay Jeter, and uh, I'm reading the full the uh, um role of Darius and mirror image. Of Darius. Yeah, in the mirror image of Darius. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, great. So let's start at the bottom of page forty. When you're ready, Brian, to shoot. All right. Interior, exterior, millionaire's castle, first floor, afternoon. On a sunny forested hillside is a beautiful mansion with a hedge maze and an Olympic-sized pool. Interior, exterior, mansion's pool. Darius falls and plunges headfirst into the Olympic-sized pool wearing nothing but Speedos. The water breaks around him as his eyes bulge at the amazing change of scenery. Fighting for air, he rises from the pool to a beautiful open air grotto. There are well manicured bushes surrounding the Grecian style pool and marble benches next to the marble columns that seem to reach towards the sky. A butler addresses Darius. Your towel, sir. What in the world is going on here? And why am I naked? The demon steps out from behind one of the ficus plants lining the edge of the nearby garden. The lap of luxury, Darius, and it can all be yours. Drowning me is your idea of a lap of living the life of luxury? A dramatic license. You know, this way it gets better. <laughs> you know. The demon gestures a come hither motion. Darius exits the pool, grabs the towel from the butler, and throws it to the ground. Interior, hallway, later. Darius is still dripping wet from the pool and feeling a bit uncomfortable because of the lack of clothing. This can be yours. They turn a corner, and there is a jacuzzi full of beautiful women. All of it can be yours. The women wave and gesture at Darius, and that's when he notices the obsidian black-eyed twin in the jacuzzi as well. She raises a champagne glass to Darius. It's not so bad to be infamous. The glowing yes. white-eyed twin and the butler step from behind Darius. Yes, it is not so good to be lost. Will you be joining the ladies, Master Darius? Darius looks at the jacuzzi and then looks at the glowing white-eyed twin. Is this one of those damned if I do, damned if I don't scenarios? No, it is just a choice. Ah, but choices are what make this world go round. <laughs> Hell. I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning if it, if, if it weren't for a choice. I merely choose to do what I do, to do what I'm good at, and, and, and so should you. The perks are phenomenal. Darius walks away from the jacuzzi, looks out the window. There's an assortment of luxury cars, Hummers, Ferraris, and Lamborghinis. Darius rubs his chin and scowls. Oh, this is mine? Oh, <laughs> this and more. The demon throws open the patio doors, revealing a helicopter. Yeah, just in case you don't feel like driving. Darius is shocked. 
Is this real? No. Yes. No. Yes. The twins stare at one another for a second, then look at Darius. No. What the ladies mean to say is that this is only as real as you make it. So if I want a room full of gold, you can give me that? The demon snaps his fingers, and behind them, the butler wheels in several stacks of gold. You all gold, sir. This is too much. Well, if you want less, just say so. The demon claps his hand, and the butler exits with the gold. The world can be your oyster. At what price? The demon snaps his fingers, and the walls of the mansion slide away like sheets of paper. Join us, the few, the proud, the demonic. Lightning flashes, and before Darius are the hordes of hell. They are eerie yet beautiful. They slither and slide amongst each other with a trans-dimensional ease. Some shimmer like rose gold, while others glow with a preternatural light. Darius is fascinated. The demon smiles. He has seen enough. The world warps around Darius, and he is transported instantly to the cathedral. The walls are back to their original fresco, and there are people sitting in the seats below. Interior, cathedral balcony, morning. The demon is gone. The twins are sitting on the balcony railing, facing a dizzy Darius. You understand now? Is the question clear? Sort of. I think I understand. Good. We will see you in several days. Your decision should be made by then. The twins proceed to get up and leave when Darius stops them with a final question. Am I that important? The Every twins keep their backs to him. Every soul is. Every knee shall bow. Whom shall you serve? The twins depart down the steps, slowly fading away. Darius rubs his eyes and looks at his watch. Time has lapsed and it is now morning. Incredible. Interior, coffee shop, later. Darius is excited. Coffee mates Tim and Sarah are gathered around a radio just beneath the counter. Police are still on the lookout for the subject in yesterday's daring car chase throughout Midtown and the suburbs. The stolen vehicle used in the chase was found abandoned this morning at the Walmart parking lot just north of Highway I-10. Darius freezes, eyes wide at the door. Mr. Gruder emerges from the office, shocked to see the stiff as a rail Darius. I thought I told you to take the day off. I know, sir. But I'm just too stoked to sleep in today. Or go to the doctor. It's like the wool's been removed from my eyes. I'm a new man with the world at my feet. Darius yawns. New man or not, you still look a wee bit tired. And after our scare yesterday, uh, I don't know. Darius panics. Oh, come on. Are you sure? I mean, it's not every day that one of our most trusted employees hides in a closet because of two little girls at the front door. Darius is relieved, realizing that Mr. Gruder has no sense of what really happened the day before. I see Tim admitted to those girls being there. Yes, he did, but he said they were more cute than scary. No fears, Mr. Grunter. I can hack it. Just watch me. Yesterday was the old me. Today is the new. Darius begins taking orders. Interior, coffee shop, later. The day proceeds at a hurried pace. The camera frame rate speeds up, showing the passing of time. Customers come and go from the coffee shop like a blur. Darius's hands are a flurry of motion as cup after cup is created to the customer's satisfaction. 
Coffee mates Tim and Sarah stand back and watch Darius work. This is why he is the best employee at the coffee shop. Interior, Darius's apartment, night. Okay, Darius wait, wait a second, wait a second. Just for the children's part, everybody just say yay and see the children's part, okay? Just, mm -hmm. just to help her out so she doesn't say, have to say the children's part by herself, okay? Okay. All right, okay. All right there you go. Sorry. Go ahead, Brian. No problem. Thank you. Interior, Darius's apartment, night. Darius is sprawled out on his couch, one hand on his head, the other is on the remote control. He knows that he hasn't slept in 24 hours, yet he still does not feel tired. Ambivalent to the feat that has occurred this day, Darius flicks on the TV. It's a Sesame Street type program. There's a sock puppet surrounded by children. The other sock puppets watch from the background. Hi kids, Corky McCork here. Say, you know what we're going to learn today? That's right, our ABCs. Yay! Yay! Let's get started. A, B, C. Darius turns the channel, but is the same sock puppet show from a different angle. F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Darius flicks the channel rapidly, but keeps getting the same show. W, X, Y, and Z. Now I know my ABCs. Next time, Darius, don't turn it off of me. Darius sticks his finger in his ear and shakes it. Darius is dreaming. All the children turn towards the television camera. The cherub is amongst them. It's time we talked again. All the children simultaneously nod. Yeah. The TV screen overloads in a flash of bright yellow light. Interior, field two, day. Ah, uh, sanctuary. Darius is in a Roman Ben-Hur type robe. The cherub is in a mini version of the same robe. Darius looks down at the outfit and spins around. Smiling Darius begins to pose. Who robes? Ah. Gladiator. Darius, I need to clarify some things with you. Like what? Heaven and hell. I thought I had seen both of them. Those were just visages. You need to find out what they really are and why they exist. The cherub walks with Darius to a point in the field that looks similar to one man theater entertainment system. A projection screen looms out of the hillside and a recliner is parked strategically in front of it. Take a seat, please. Darius sits down as the cherub grabs the remote control. First off, this is Satan. Well, he's not ugly at all. The camera pans on the faces of the cherub and Darius. The face of the screen is just outside the view of the camera. That's why they call him temptation. The cherub flicks a button and whirling lights flash across their glowing faces. She's pretty. Satan. The cherub presses another button. Cute puppy. Satan. The cherub presses another button. Great car. Satan. The cherub clicks the button a final time. Are you telling me that butterfly? Is Satan. What you can do in here, in Sanctuary, he can do in the world. Darius is confused. If Satan is so mischievous, why doesn't God come down and, you know, blast him? Now we are getting to the good part. The cherub programs the remote with one hand. Just like hell, has an army, so does heaven. Darius, this is the host of heaven. The camera pans toward the face of the screen. There is a mass of bodies shown in white light. Some of their heads are adorned in crowns of light while others have halos. There are giants among them whose faces cannot be seen. All are robed and some of them even carry golden weapons. Darius is seeing the hierarchy of heaven. There are seraphim, cherubim, and in the distance, odd multicolored forms 
are seen possibly th thrones, powers, or principalities. In the end, two archangels step into view, swords drawn, blocking Darius's attempt to see further in. The cherub immediately steps in front of Darius's chair. Think of this as a recruiting tape. We are looking for a few good souls. That sounds a little like Mr. O'Foley said. Exactly the same, except he wishes to steal from the Lord that which is pleasing and righteous. I must be righteous then. You have potential. And don't get me wrong, but they in serves his purpose. The cherub leans in towards Darius. God allows Satan to do his evil in order to separate the weak from the strong amongst the chosen. And believe me, you're all at one point in time has chosen. Your time is now. You can either be the best of the best or the worst of the worst. Darius awakens to the sound of an alarm clock. Interior, Darius to the apartment, morning. Darius stretches and yawns. He's amazingly refreshed. Ooh, I feel good. He goes, takes a shower, dresses, and sits at the kitchenette to eat his donut and coffee. Ah, you lazy, wretched bums. What are you going to do? Stay in the house all day and wait for the government to send you a check? Ah, get out of your mom's house and find a job. Darius smacks the radio off and proceeds to work. Exterior, sidewalk in front of apartment later. Darius looks the... Darius locks the front door holding a half-eaten donut when Ms. Smith approaches. You're doing a fine job so far, but project's not done until it's done. I hear you, Ms. Smith. I'll do a little more painting this afternoon after I get back from work. Weather permitting, of course. Sure. Your word is your bond, as the old folks used to say. Don't let me down. I won't. Darius throws the donut into his mouth and jogs down the street. Exterior, sidewalk in front of coffee shop, later. Darius is about 20 feet from the door when he is stopped by a friendly voice and turns to see sitting in a gold convertible Jaguar is the beautiful Scandinavian woman. Excuse me? Yeah, you. Do you know of any real good places for a girl to stop and have breakfast? You're kidding, right? Kidding? Well, see that building up there? That's the coffee shop that I work in. You can always find a good bagel and some juice in there. Fabulous. The Scandinavian woman with stuntman accuracy parks the car in seconds and hops out. So you are the manager, yes? The Scandinavian woman grabs Darius's arm as they approach the coffee shop door. No, I'm just an employee. Oh. That is too bad. Maybe things will change, yes? Was Mr. Grunter's health? I doubt it. Who is Mr. Grunter? Interior, exterior, coffee shop, continuous. They enter the coffee shop with arms locked together just as Mr. Gruder <clears throat> comes out of the office. The Scandinavian woman gives Mr. Gruder a stare similar to Samantha from Bewitched. Mr. Gruder falls over deathly ill. Mr. Gruder, are you all right? Ouch, it's, it's the strangest thing. All, all of a sudden, my, my belly feels like it's, like it's on fire. Do, do you want some antacids or, or seltzer? No, uh, Darius, I think this is something worse than indigestion. Mr. Gruder falls to one knee. Whoa, Mr. Gruder, you don't look so good. So, I might call the ambulance. The coffee shop patrons watch as coffee mate Sarah runs off. I'm on it. The Scandinavian woman shows a faint smile as she looks down at Mr. Gruder now laying on the floor. Coffee mate Sarah rushes back to Mr. Gruder's side as an ambulance screeches up to the coffee shop door. Darius, no matter what, the shop stays open. You hear me? The shop stays open. You are officially the manager until I return. The ambulance technicians put Mr. Gruder on the stretcher. Mr. Gruder wails in pain while holding his belly as they cart him away. Oh, 
Re remember, the, the shop stays open. Darius picks up Mr. Gruder's managerial cap and with an odd reverence puts it on. Okay, people, you heard the man. The shop stays open, so let's get to work. Darius, with his hands on his hips, begins guiding patrons back to their seats. The Scandinavian woman and Darius share a glance before she smiles quaintly and takes her seat. Darius knows something is wrong, but before he can ask, the phone rings. Interior, exterior, the coffee shop office. Darius rushes into the office and picks up the phone. A familiar voice is on the line. <laughs> How does it feel to be in charge? Who is this? What do you mean in charge? <laughs> You're the manager of the coffee shop, aren't you? Damn it, how did you do that? Why did you hurt Mr. Grunter? He's a good man. Uh, he was in the way. Darius, these are but small things that we can do for you. Well, what if I don't want it? I was happy with my life the way it was. Oh, do you really think that if you were happy that we would be having this conversation? Like all men, you feel dissatisfied with the status quo and yearn for a little power and excitement. Look out, look out the office, look out the office window at the young lady you spoke to earlier. Interior, exterior, office. <clears throat> Darius peeks out the door. The Scandinavian woman looks at him and gives a friendly wave. Ah, beautiful, isn't she? You know that she can be yours, right? Unbelievable. This was all a setup. <laughs> Surely you didn't think a woman of, of that caliber would find, find a, ca a coffee shop boy you know, of any interest. There is no way in the world that I'm going to accept any gift from you. <laughs> My boy, you already have. The phone clicks and hangs up on the other end. Darius, wondering what the demon meant, looks into the mirror, rubbing his forehead, and sees the managerial cop on his, cap on his head. He realizes that everything he has done this day has been because of the demon's machinations. Interior coffee shop. Darius walks out of the office and places the managerial cap on his coffee mate Sarah's head. You're in charge now until Mr. Grunner gets back. But there's only a lot more time before we close. Man, you should at least finish up the day. No, I'm going to leave early. I've had enough excitement for one day. Whatever, man, but you know by bailing like this, I'm going to have to report you to the big man when he gets back. If he gets back. Okay, let's pause a second. Um, there's knocking in the background. It's, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's me. Yeah, okay, that's, that's your baby? That's your son? Okay, uh, all right, that's cool. All right, let's go on, continue. All right. Darius throws off his apron and walks toward the door. The Scandinavian woman eagerly gets up. Darius, in a sardonic manner, motions her to stay seated as he exits the coffee shop. Exterior, apartment, second floor, later. The entire top floor of the apartments is painted. Darius, a level lower, sits almost meditating as he paints. Cheep, cheep, cheep. Hey, buddy. How's it hanging? You were to tell me that someone else is coming? Directly beneath him are the twins. Darius, we came to tell you that in a day's time, you will have to make your decision. Darius lays backward almost playfully. And what if I don't want to make that decision? Thunder crackles over a, thunder crackles over a jet glowing white sky. You will. The twins walk down the street just as Miss Smith comes out to check on the painting progress. Uh, cute girls. What was that, Miss Smith? Uh, uh, nothing. How's it going up there? The weather's still on our side. I thought I heard lightning. That you did. That you did. Call it a day and let the paint dry before the storm comes in. I don't think it's going to rain. A droplet of water hits the scaffolding in front of Darius. He looks up, 
to see an unnatural storm forming. On the other hand, Miss Smith, I think I will call it a day. Darius puts down his paintbrush and climbs down the scaffolding. Hope this doesn't ruin the job you've done so far. <clears throat> For some reason, I'm not even concerned. Darius looks at the sky. Come on, Lord. I have not believe after all the work I've done, you will ruin my work for no reason. Immediately, the storm blows over and huge gales of wind blast the apartment walls. The paint is being blasted dry. It's a miracle. I guess so. I should try that more often. Interior, coffee shop, night. The cherub sits confidently at the center table. At the entrance are the twins who are dressed and acting like doormen. Thunder and lightning clap as the demon approaches the door. With a shove of the glass, he saunters past the twins. So, What is the purpose of this meeting? We must end this soon. Who says? The cherub points upward just as thunder claps in the background. He says. Why, we barely started to test this young man's resolve. He barely knows the depths of pleasures that await him. Some things are better left to the imagination. And who are you to judge the level's, the level's depth of his soul? True. There is so much that could be learned and revealed if we continue. True. The demon shrugs his shoulders smugly. Well, then we are at an impasse. Yeah, it does end, but through a final series of tests. And after that, it will be decision time for Darius. Ah, oh, it's bogus. Oh. The cherub stands and adjusts her little suit. Everyone knows you're enjoying tormenting this little man. That fair is simply fair. And God is starting to favor Darius. Oh, alas. Pish posh. Time's a wasting. Uh, very well. Hastily. Uh, very well. You know what? But I get first crack at him. The chair walks away and turns back slightly. So be it. The chair vanishes in a blaze of glowing bright white. Demon, who is still seated, does the same in a haze of obsidian black smoke. Interior, Darius's apartment, night. Darius stares out the window, wondering if it is that easy to talk to the Almighty. Storm rages outside the window as Darius begins to pray aloud. Uh, outside of the cathedral, this is probably the third or fourth time in my life that I've prayed to you. And I'm not quite sure what to say. This whole decision is really driving me well a little bonkers. I thought that you were an absentee landlord. You know, you built the place for the tenants, but you were never around to when they complain. But now I see you were just busy taking care of business. And the whole idea of people allowing people to make decisions to be saved or be damned is well, it's too much to comprehend. I thank you for free will and all, but sometimes people need for certain decisions to be made for them. Thanks for listening. Darius gets up off his now bended knees and makes his way to bed, knowing that a peaceful night's rest is not what he is going to get. Before he can close his eyes. It's called free will and it separates the weak from the strong. Darius is startled, but not scared. No one gave you permission to be in here, Miss um, Barton? Yeah, fine, then I'll, I'll leave. But when I heard that prayer of yours, you know, I thought to myself, now this guy has legitimate questions. I don't want your answers, buddy, now go. 
Uh, certainly. But you answered your own question, you know. Free will is the answer. The demon walks towards the door and gives a mournful look back. So free will is the key? Ye yes. That is the reason why he can't force you to do his will. You see, you, you see, when he created man in his own image, he imparted some of his essence into man, his will. That is why man is above the animals that run on instinct. But a little less than angels. I remember hearing something like, like that a while back. Yeah, you're the clever one indeed. Mm-hmm. But what about you? Aren't you an angel? Uh, okay. Oh, uh, so, okay. Okay. Now you're presuming too much. Okay. I was just like you. I had a wife and kids, but he took that away from me. So my decision was clear. You, on the other hand, don't have any attachments. That makes you ideal. For what? <laughs> service what else could I mean the hordes of hell are waiting for a soldier like you you mean like a grunt or a pawn I mean a general all I have to do is join your ranks yeah we can preempt this entire test with just a simple yes just say it, Darius, and this world will be yours for the taking. No. What? No. I still have time to decide. And I'm not going to make any decisions until it's necessary. You know what? Fine by me. But don't ask for my help in the future, and you will surely need it. See you. Definitely wouldn't want to be you. The demon snorts again, then walks out the door. Interior, Darius' apartment, morning. He is clear, he is already out of bed and sitting at the kitchenette. He has a cup of coffee in his hand and is looking at some of his bills. Well, 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 another day has creeped upon us, and you still haven't done a single goddamn thing to change your pathetic life. Well, 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 maybe finding a job and going to work is too difficult for you, your highness. Ah, get off your lazy asses and do something with your pathetic lives. Darius, wide-eyed, turns off the radio. Why do I listen to this crap? He takes a final sip of Joe and walks out the door. Exterior, sidewalk, in front of apartment. Darius walks down the steps of the apartment, and like clockwork, there's Mrs. Smith grinning from ear to ear. You even got a bit earlier today. I just want to see if Mr. Grunner is back. Is he all right? Let's just say he had a minor accident. Oh, I do hope he'll be okay. Let's just say he had better be okay. And don't worry. I'll finish up when I get back this afternoon. Uh, you know, I'll be back to finish the painting. So leave my brushes and my overalls out. Will do, Darius. Thanks. Darius walks down the street, feeling satisfied with the conversation. Interior, exterior, coffee shop. Darius is just about to enter the coffee shop when he sees the Scandinavian woman driving by in a Porsche Carrera GT. The, she looks excited as Darius stares at her, but then begins to frown. Darius is standing with his arms crossed and he shakes his head from side to side, signaling no. The Porsche blazes off in a cloud of smoke as Darius enters the shop. Interior, coffee shop. Darius enters the coffee shop. Once again, coffee mates Tim and Sarah are listening to the radio beneath the counter. This is day two of the intensive manhunt for Tuesday's carjacking and chase from the police. The radio news announcer then proceeds to physically describe Darius. 
Darius walks over to the radio and playfully clicks it off. He then snaps both of his co-workers on the back. Takes all type of types in this world. Yeah, but this guy is a lunatic. You're telling me, man, if I would try to stunt like that, I'd be rotten in jail by now. It's always the deranged who seem to get away with stuff like that. Sarah, you in charge, right? I opened the shop today all by myself. No thanks to you. Then should we not be working right now? Coffee Maid Sarah looks at Darius with much attitude and with much bravado blurts out. All right, peeps. Well, all have jobs to do. Well, what are you waiting for? Back to work. The day proceeds at a normal pace and some familiar faces pop up in the coffee shop, the most prevalent being the demon. During a break, all three coffee mates stand looking at the demon. Darius tries not to be concerned. Check that dude out. He gives me the creeps. Darius acts nonchalant. Who that guy? He's there all the time. I know, but look at the way he keeps staring over here like we got something he wants. More coffee? Sarah's right, man. Check out those beady little eyes. The demon squints as if he can hear them talk. And that suction puck face, you just know he's up to no good. Just look like that robber. In fact, he is sort of dressed like that robber. I don't feel <clears throat> safe no more. He is definitely up to no good. The demon raises one eyebrow and nods his head. Coffee mates Tim and Sarah lean back simultaneously after the gesture. Without moving his lips, coffee mate Tim whispers to Sarah. He can't hear us, can he? Oh my God, he's getting up, act busy. The coffee mates abandon Darius at the counter as the demon approaches. May I help you, sir? Uh, no, I, I just want to congratulate you on the outstanding service and the decorum of this establishment. Well, thank you, sir. I'll be sure to tell the manager of your compliments once he returns. And when will that be? Never. The demon smiles. I'd prefer if it happens soon. Darius and the demon stare each other down. Ungrateful lad. You'd look a gift horse in the mouth. Very well. The demon exits the coffee shop. What's that all about? You two don't know each other, do you? At that instant, Mr. Gruder enters the coffee shop, bright and full of joy. Ta-da, I'm back. All the coffee mates rush to Mr. Gruder's side. Darius embraces him. Thought you wasn't going to, sir. All right, all right. It was just a tummy ache. Acid reflux and a, a bad case of it. We've been keeping the shop in tip-top shape, Mr. Gruder. Mr. Gruder notices the manager cap on coffee mate Sarah's head and takes it off with a snatch. Darius, my office now. They walk over to the office. Interior, coffee shop office. Both men take a seat. Darius, when I left the shop the other day, I was, I was your, it was your responsibility to watch over everything, correct? Yes. Uh, what happened, son? Did you wig out again? Was it too much for you to handle? No. I just didn't feel it was time for me to take the reins of control. I just wasn't ready. I can't shake the feeling that I, I could have done more. I, somehow I was responsible for you getting sick. Uh, how? Did you make me eat the bad potato salad the night before? No. It's just, 
that I always wanted a place like this for myself. So what are you telling me? Is that you, you, you secretly wish me to be sick? Mr. Gruder begins to laugh uncontrollably. You just don't understand. And you can't understand. If wishing someone ill actually worked, my father, God rest his soul, would have died in my youth instead of just three years ago at the ripe old age of 86. I mean, think about it. If wishes like yours has any merit, the world would be barren because everybody would be dead or sick in bed. I guess you're right, Mr. Brunner. Damn straight I'm right. The whole idea, I, I mean, I swear, you kids nowadays are just too sensitive, or, or is it naive? Is that all, sir? Certainly. Unless you want to wish me back to the hospital. Mr. Gruder continues to laugh as Darius gets up to leave. Exterior apartment sidewalk later. Darius is applying the final coat of paint on the ground level of the apartment. It is amazing what a person can do once they apply themselves. You said it, Miss Smith. I think I finished a record time. What you did was a great job. A job that would have taken several men twice the time to complete. I am truly amazed. So, are we screwing the rent? Of course. In fact, I'll deduct, a, I'll deduct a portion of the work off the next month's rent. You're a saint, Miss Smith. I wouldn't go that far, but I try. I'll take the scaffold down tomorrow. Miss Smith walks back into the apartment with a smile on her face. Darius follows her, wiping paint off his face. Interior, Darius's apartment. Darius exits the shower, revitalized, and heads towards the window. There's a beautiful red, orange, yellow sunset over the horizon. Darius crosses his arms and just stares. Beautiful. Exterior, sidewalk, morning. Darius locks the door to the building and walks down the street. As he walks around the corner, he sees a bank truck spinning wildly out of control. Interior bank car. A, a security guard is on the radio calling out for help. This is Alpha Omega Tango. Repeat, Alpha Omega Tango requesting immediate assistance at the corner of Bergen and Myers. At that instant, the bank car flips end over end. Exterior, sidewalk, continuous. Darius is in shock as bags of money and human bodies go flying out of the back of the bank car. After the dust settles, there are two bodies lying face down on the pavement. The, security, the third security guard is pinned between the open windshield and the pavement. Help, oh God, somebody help me. Darius wanders over to the voice, but trips on something. It is a bar of gold. Darius hesitates for a moment and takes notice of the scene. There is more money strewn about than he has ever seen in all of his life. The words Grand Vista Casino is labeled on some of the tags. On other tags is the name First Maritime Bank. Darius realizes that this was no ordinary bank car when he hears the voice again. Please, for Christ's sake, help me. This is more money than Darius has seen in all his life. On instinct and greed, he begins pocketing the money. All right. All right, already, I'm, I'm coming. Darius, pockets full of cash, finally goes over to the voice and is revulsed by the carnage he sees. Oh, thank God, somebody did come. Help me, I, I'm, I'm trapped. Hang on, no time, right? Let me see if I can wedge this roof off you. Darius hops over debris, looking for something to pry the pin man free and finds a fallen tree branch. Now I'm gonna try to lift this thing off of you. And when I do, you try to pull yourself free. The security guard nods his head and begins to scream as Darius shoves the branch between the metal roof and the guard's body. 
on the count of three. One, two. Darius begins forcing the roof back, and just when the roof starts to raise, the branch cracks and breaks. The security guard cries aloud in pain. Don't worry. I'll find something else. Exterior, Darius' apartment. Darius dashes down the street back to the apartment lattice. The scaffolding is made of metal pipes that Darius unceremoniously knocks to the ground. He begins frantically unscrewing by hand the metal structure, prying bars left and right until one comes loose. Exterior, sidewalk, moments later. Darius rushes back to the scene of the accident. Except for the security guard, not another person is in sight. Where's an ambulance when you need one? Darius takes the pipe and places it more gently this time under the metal death trap. All right, we're going to try this one more time. The security guard eyes him with trepidation. The count of three. Oh, screw it. Three! Darius, with all his might, cranks the metal bar higher and higher before he hears a loud wrenching sound. The roof and the bar have bent, but not off the pinned guard. Jesus! Darius panics and frantically looks for something to wedge in between the trap when it dawns on him to jump inside the vehicle. It is a cul-de-sac of twisted metal and debris. Darius sees the guard's legs and torso. He starts pulling and yanking at the wreckage, finally getting his hands under the guard's hip and the ground. He pulls at the metal entrapment. God, help me! Amazingly, the roof begins to move, but just as hope rises, a crunching noise rolls out and the roof collapses. A small pool of blood can be seen flowing from the guard's waist. Darius leaps from the wreckage and runs to the front of the bank car where the guard, chest apparently crushed, lays motionless. The sound of sirens blare in the background as Darius, dazed and confused, emerges from the bank car. Darius looks at the sky. You can draw paint on the side of a building on useless walls, but you can't help me save a man's life? The ambulance technicians run to, to the heap as several cops exit their vehicles. The sound of walkie-talkies and CB chatter fill the air. Oh. Holy mother Holy God. Holy mother of I... God, what happened here? Look at the kid. He's just staring at the sky. Uh, sir, are you okay? Did you see what happened here? Darius slowly but surely looks down. Dead. They're all dead. So you saw what happened? So tried to help. Phil. Son, um son, listen, I'm the sure you did as much as you number I'm one sure, glances at the accident. Yeah. Son, I'm sure you did as much as any of us on our own could do. That's right, kid. Freaky things like this happen all the time. Sometimes you just have to go with the flow. You did good by trying to help. Policeman 2 consoles Darius as the ambulance texts and more police rush to the scene. There is just so much that any of us can do. No! This was different. It was a setup. Darius points at the sky. You set me up. Okay, one second. Both one policemen second. look no, at each other second. confused. One second. One second. Um, when you say you set me up, now I, I've been noticing that you know you guys have been doing a great job, and it's like a lot of the things have been you know you know what words didn't make sense to put in, you didn't put in. But for some of these things, I have exclamation marks and stuff like that. Just make sure you put emphasis on it. You know what I'm saying? He's pointing Gosh. up at the sky. You set me up. You know what I'm saying? So, all right, cool, cool. Okay. 
Want to start again with Darius points to the sky? I want to hear him say it. <laughs> gotcha. uh, Darius points no. to the sky. You set me up. Both policemen look at each other confused. Ed, you're, su- you're muted, Ed. Ed, you're muted. Ed, you're muted. There you go. Got it. I'm sorry about that. I'm like, hey, take it easy, son. Who set you up? We have a situation here at the scene of the accident. One very hysterical male African American. I'm not crazy. No, no, no. No one said you were crazy. Just maybe a wee bit exhausted. The policeman extend his hands to comfort Darius. Without hesitating, Darius bolts past the policemen who begin to pursue him. Kid, wait. What's your name? Darius, at full speed, dashes down a nearby alley. Let's stop one second. Interior, park, afternoon. Brian, Brian let's stop one second. All right. All right. Um, let's hear for policeman number two. I, I'm, I'm, I, I want to see... Cordy Lynch say it a little bit better. <laughs> I want to, I want to, okay. uh, yeah. So we'll, we'll start with the kid. We'll, we'll start where it says, kid, wait, what's your name? You know what I'm saying? She's kind of, she's trying to stop him. Kid, wait, what's your name? Okay, okay. good. All right. Okay. Kid, wait, what's your name? Darius, at full speed, dashes down the nearby alley. Interior, park. Afternoon, Darius walks to the vacant bench and takes a seat. The sun is blazing down on him like the wrath of God. Darius, with a worried look on his face, wonders aloud to himself. Is this some kind of cruel joke? Darius weeps. There is nothing you could do. Darius looks up to see the cherub sitting next to him on the park bench. It was their time to go. No. I was grieved. If I had helped sooner, the guard might have still been alive. I could have made a difference. Possibly, but that wouldn't have not changed the outcome. It was his time to go. It's just odd. It felt like a test and I failed. No, you passed with flying colors. The glowing white obsidian black-eyed bird swoops down in front of them. There is a rainbow-colored light being emitted from his tail. Glitter and white light saturate the landscape as Darius shakes and convulses vigorously. Darius is dreaming. Interior, field number two, twilight. When Darius opens his eyes, he is in sanctuary, but for some strange reason, is glowing, growing dark, and there is a telephone booth a yard away from him. The single solitary cloud that is in the sky rumbles and the phone rings. Darius, more distraught than curious, picks up the phone. Hello, hello. There is no response. Hello? Who's there? The receiver is still silent, but the thunder from the cloud grows louder. Uh, I get it. The shoe, isn't it? God? A bolt of lightning flashes across the sky. Well, what was the point of this morning? What kind of test is that when you kill an innocent man? There is silence, then a voice is heard through the phone that sounds suspiciously familiar. The call you've made cannot go through. Please hang up and try again. Say what? You gotta be kidding me, even in my own soul? I'm still getting a runaround? No, I'm not gonna hang up. The message is repeated over again. Darius screams. That's it! I've had enough of this cryptic shit. You're going to answer me. The phone gives a dial tone and Darius slams it back on the hook. Then Darius points his finger in the air. It's your fault. It's all your fault. 
Why did I have to see a man die? Why did not help? Why didn't you help? The phone rings again. Darius, scoffing, picks up the phone. There was nothing you could do. It was his time to go. You being there was coincidence. You did your best, and he appreciated it. But I felt so helpless, so out of control, like a lost child. Most of us are lost, but eventually, you all come home. I don't want this responsibility. It's too hard. Think of it as a blessing, for in his time of need, you comforted him. A task usually left for the divine. Now Darius is silent. His eyes fill with tears. So is he okay? Very. The cherub walks up from behind Darius and hands him a tablet. On the screen is the image of the security guard smiling and waving his hand. Ooh. Voice number two returns to the operator's dialect as the sound of a whistle and click drone through the receiver. Please place an additional 25 cents to continue the call. God, it's called a cell phone. Look at it next time you, you need to talk. More whistles and clicks are heard as Jerry hangs up the phone. So now you see. Yes. There is a flash of light and Darius awakens still on the park bench. Tomorrow your decision will have to be made. Enjoy life, Darius. There is still so much to do. The cherub gets up and walks down the wooded pathway. The sun sets in a rapid time-lapse motion. Darius sits there until evening when he gets up and walks into town. Exterior, club, night. Lights are ablaze and the sound of music can be heard pulsating in the background. There is a stream of human bodies coming and going from the once abandoned factory that had been turned into a rave type club. Interior club. Darius wanders into the club wide eyed and perplexed for he knows this will be his last hurrah. Welcome to Dingo's. I'm Stacy. What's your name? Darius. Welcome Darius. Would you like a shot? The club girl hands Darius a tray of jello shots. Darius jiggles it for a sec, then chugs the shots. Not bad. Then have another. They're free on the house. Darius chugs three more shots before he sees the effects. The colors brighten and the room spins. Darius, dazed Darius, walks to the far end of the club all the while bumping into people left and right before the fog lifts and he sees the truth. Every person in the club has either glowing white or obsidian black eyes, but they are not fighting. All the patrons are intermingling, dancing and talking as if their perspective sides this night doesn't matter. The music grows frenetic and then some familiar faces appear. Interior, club, moments later. First, dancing in a homoerotic manner are the twins. They gyrate and twist on each other as if they were one creature. Darius begins to dance with them in the scenario similar to an orgy. In the corner of the bar is the demon and the Scandinavian woman. The demon raises his glass to Darius in a sign of approval. Finally, on a projection screen at the top of the club are images of the cherub and the dog beast playing joyfully. Interior, exterior, club, later. The party bleeds out of the rave club onto the street. Darius is in the midst of this rave, surrounded by pulsating bodies. He is hoisted up in a crucifix manner above the crowd. As he swirls over the crowd, the music fades as Darius stares into the nighttime sky. He is full of grief because he knows these moments will not last. All my life, I thought of things as black and white, good or bad. Never I'd imagine the insurmountable amount of gray that exists in this world. Never had I thought that light needs darkness as much as darkness needs light. My choice in that other world would have been simple. 
a matter of moral upbringing. But now, all that matters is the choice of hand. And the feelings that I have inside of me, that I know will define me come tomorrow. Interior, Darius' apartment, morning. Darius sits cross-legged on his bed, his chin resting on his fist. He has not slept this night, for he knows that sleep will not be a concern anymore. The digital clock hits 7 a.m. and the radio pops on. Get up, lazy bones! Rise and shine, losers! So what are your plans for today, hmm? Lay on the couch and gain another 10 pounds? Life is meant to be lived. Do something with your lazy, pathetic, goddamn lives. Darius smiles and gingerly gets up and grabs his coat and walks out the door. That's it, Kimosabi. I hear those bed sheets are rustling. Interior, exterior, park, morning. The street in front of the park is lined with cars. Horns honk and the sound of babies and dogs yelping are in the background. Instinctively, Darius turns into the park and solemnly strolls down the wooded pathway. Interior, park. At the right, next to the jungle gym, is a bench. Darius takes a seat. The glowing white obsidian black-eyed bird lands in front of it and begins to dance in a circle. Darius is fixated on the bird when the dancing suddenly stops. A ripping sound cracks through the air as if the bird itself begins to split into two separate birds. One bird is an obsidian black-eyed crow. The other is a glowing white-eyed, glowing white dove. Both birds fly into Darius's chest, merging with him. Darius begins to hallucinate. Interior, exterior, Nazi Germany. The first images he sees are war and peace. Images of the Holocaust and peacetime Germany overlap. Children are seen playing together in the streets and moments later, some of those children are seen hailing the Fuhrer while others lie in piles of bodies and unmarked graves. Books are dumped into the streets and burned while images of printing presses running nonstop shill out leaflet after leaflet of propaganda. The only book left untouched is the Bible and it gathers dust on the shelf. The light from the bonfires casts an eerie hue on its cross embodied cover. Exterior, ancient Europe. He sees ancient centurions burning innocent villages and slaying women and children. He sees Etruscan beauty in Tuscan valleys. Grapes in vineyards fade into images of wine in flask as it flows from cup to cup. There are men on horseback in front of legions of spear and lance carrying troops. They are marching forward towards an army of similar but barbaric dress. The sides collide in a splattering of blood and screams. Interior, exterior, war in the future. There is, an even, there is even a visage of future war. Spacecraft of unimaginable magnitude ablaze in the nighttime sky as lasers blast past them into the heavens. These monolithic flying machines hum with the same resonance of an angelic choir as they release their payload of neon obsidian black colored missiles. The unearthly vessels are melt, met by a barrage of ground fire ranging from glowing white lasers to neon glowing white missiles. Cities and forts are covered with an electric glowing white force field as if out of a Flash Gordon comic book. Fire engulfs the apocalyptic scene. Interior hospital ward. Next, Darius sees an African-American child being born into this world as an old black man dies in a wheelchair. Darius's vision leads him through the hallways of this fictitious hospital to an infirmary ward. Comatose patients awaken and the cripples stand from their beds and walk while the nurse and doctors fall ill. The world is being turned on its ear. Exterior. Plains of Africa. An Ethiopian banquet is spread on a wooden festive table. There are hundreds of round belly Africans eating at the banquet. 
Several hundred yards away past Stoned Gate are thousands of destitute poor, and just beyond the city gates are the starving masses. Darius is seeing the proximity of opposites, famine and feast within yards of one another. Interior, cosmic garden. A rosebud springs from the ground, grows to maturity, and withers away. Darius looks up into the night sky and sees suns go nova. Stars collapse and fade. The nighttime sky is pulsating like a pinball machine on tilt. I understand. Interior, cosmic garden continuous. The camera spins 180 degrees to a round cast iron table and two ornate cast iron chairs. In the chair to the left sits a person who is the mirror image of Darius. The only difference is that this Darius has one glowing white and one glowing obsidian black eye. Okay, stop. That was excellent. That was a lot of reading, <laughs> Brian. You killed it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I want to, like I said before, when you read this part, I want you to say beforehand, mirror image of Darius and Darius, so that there's a clear understanding of what you're, what you're doing. Now, unless you want to differentiate it, you're a different gotcha. way. I have a hood. Can I, should I, I have a hood right here, son. Mirror image going to be the hood. Could've, yeah, it'd be fine. That'd be fine. Gotcha. Instead of saying it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now the audience kind of has a clarification of what's going on. Gotcha. All right. Gotcha. Sure enough. All right. When you're ready, it's all on you. <clears throat> Welcome. Have a seat. Before them on the table is a chessboard. I know that when you, or should I say, we were a child that we never thought that those history lessons we took really have universal ramifications. So you and I are one. We're one and the same. It's very rare in life when you get a chance to talk to yourself. I understand. Oh. That's the amazing thing is that you do. That in itself is rare. And that is why I'm here. You're here to present me with the choice to give me a chance to literally look myself in the eyes. And to understand the gravity of the situation, your humanity, integrity, and resolve lie in your own hands. Most people stumble through life, never realizing that every decision, every choice shapes the future and their destiny. And there is no right or wrong. There's only truth. The truth that reflects upon your soul and your soul alone. You're not the first, and you definitely won't be the last. But you can make your mark. You can make a difference. Thank you. They shake hands. You already have. Darius is at one with the universe. He has learned of duality and its role. He has learned of life and death. He has seen his part in it all and now can make his decision. So with that, the hallucination ends. Interior park moments later. It is as if no time has passed. Darius sits on the park bench watching children play. However, when he looks up, his right eye is glowing white and his left eye is glowing obsidian black. Deep in thought, Darius rubs his chin and looks around as if searching for something. Darius smiles and finally looks forward. It is done. Ending number one, a second smile emerges across Darius's face. 
his obsidian eye, his obsidian black eye turns a sky glowing white. Images of clouds and sun rays streak through his eyes. Darius opens his arm and the obsidian black eyed crow flings from his chest squawking. An iridescent glow engulfs his body. Darius has chosen. Raising his arms even higher to the sky, Darius begins to ascend, eventually fading into the skyline. Ending number two. A second smile, more like a smirk, creeps across Darius's face. The sky darkens and lightning crackles in disapproval. Darius vomits slowly the carcass of the glowing white dove. A sickening and unnatural laughter vibrates in his mouth. Darius's glowing white eye burns obsidian black. The flames of hell are seen reverberating in the center of his obsidian eyes. Darius and the bench he sits on slowly descends into the now spewing lava and bubbling mud. All right. <clears throat> All right. That was excellent. Thank you, guys. That was perfect. That was, that was, that was, that was a hard one to go through at the end. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We had to do a lot. But um, basically I'm what stopping, happened. I'm stopping, Nathan. Is that right? Well, you can stop. Yeah, you can. That'd be good. So 